We'll be in Luke chapter 10 this morning, the gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter number 10. Luke chapter number 10, I'm going to preach a message the Lord laid on my heart several days ago that I hope will stir and challenge your heart today. I invite you to be back tonight at 5 o'clock for the evening service. Be back tonight at 5 o'clock. We'll be singing, preaching again. Got some more special music lined up. And uh, just looking forward to what God has in store for us. Luke chapter 10. The Bible says in verse number 17, the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fell from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not, verse 20, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I want to preach on this thought this morning, taking names, taking names. Lord, help us, I pray, as we dive into the scripture here and may the word of God speak to the hearts of your people. Pray for the members of Calvary Baptist Church and we're grateful, Lord, for all of our friends and, and uh, those around the country and even different countries or uh, different nations and different states in the United States that are tuned in, watching this morning. We pray that you'd use the service to bring glory to yourself. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Taking names, I, thinking about names, I get picked on some for my name. I thought about this man walking into a courthouse, demanded to see the judge. They finally led him to the room where the judge was, and the judge said, what can I do for you, sir? He said, I want to get my name changed. The judge said, well, what is your name? He said, well, my name is Leroy Stinks, Leroy Stinks. I'm tired of people picking on me, making fun of me for my name, and I want to get my name changed. The judge said, well, son, I don't blame you. Said, you're in the right place. We can definitely help you take care of that. Said, what would you like to get your name changed to? He said, I want to change my name to Pedro Stinks. <laughs> Pedro, Pedro Stinks. He wanted to get his name changed. But uh, uh, we live in a crazy world. Don't you agree? We live in a crazy world. I was reading... Fox News last night, and uh, probably shouldn't, but I did. Uh, here's what the article said. The headline said, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio told New Yorkers on Saturday that they can now snap smartphone photos of social distancing violators and text that to the authorities and enforcement will come as the coronavirus shutdown remains in place across the Big Apple. Now it's easier than ever said uh, the governor in a video posted to his official Twitter account. He said it's easier than ever when you see a crowd, when you see a line that's not distance, when you see a supermarket that's too crowded, anything, he says, you can report it right away so we can get there and fix the problem. Then he went on to say, text the photo to 311-692 and action will ensue. How do you like that little rhyme? Isn't that interesting to fix the problem? They're going to just send more people down there. And they're trying to get everybody now to take names and tell on each other and report one another. Let me just say this. If you see me violating some social distancing mandate and you report me, I'm going to pray and ask God to let you go deaf right before the trumpet sounds so you'll miss the rapture. We'll see how you like social distancing when you're left here all by yourself. Uh, remember when we were in school, they used to teach her sometimes to say, I got to step out and, I, and call on somebody to take names. You remember that? Call on somebody to come uh, and they would, they would get up out of their seat with this big air of self-importance and they'd go up there and stand by the chalkboard with a piece of chalk in their hand and they would just stare and they would just look and they would watch you, and if you breathe wrong, if you looked at them wrong, they would turn around and they would write your name in big flourishing letters on the chalkboard, taking names. Sometimes they acted like they were getting paid commission. 
I mean, it was almost as if the more names they could come up with when the teacher was out, the closer they would get to sit to Jesus at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I mean, it was unbelievable at the, at the excitement that they, would, uh, that they would cause taking names. Can I tell you something this morning? God's taking names. <laughs> God's taking names. Sure he is. I, I was looking at different places in the scripture. I'm gonna give you three different points this morning uh, that you can jot down. Three different groups of people that God is without a doubt taking names of. Number one, he's taking names of the converted. And we see that in our text this morning, Luke chapter number 10. Jesus commissioned these 70 uh, disciples in verse number one, sent them out two by two, uh, the ox and the kangaroo. No, that's a different story. Sent them out two by two before his face unto every city. And the Bible says that he sent them out to go and preach the gospel, gave them some pretty uh, specific rules to go by in verse number two and down in those following verses. And the Bible tells us in verse number 17 that when the 70 returned again with joy, they were excited saying even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Jesus being God in the flesh made a statement in verse number 18 that I know uh, that the Jehovah's Witnesses have a hard time explaining. Jesus said, I beheld Satan cast down from heaven. Now how you reckon he did that if he originated in Luke 2 and wasn't there way back before the fall of man to see Satan cast down out of heaven? Can I get a witness right there? Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fell from heaven. And behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Uh, there are some groups of people, we go down to the mountains of West Virginia and other places, we got what they call snake handlers. Yeah, they bring snakes into the church in a, in a box or a cage and they get to singing, they get, their, they get all excited, they get all worked up and they get all psyched out and the next thing you know, some super spiritual idiot reaches over in that box and grabs a snake. And I ain't talking about garter snakes. We ain't talking about little, little pythons and we're not talking about those little... Uh, uh, those little harmless things. We're talking about rattlesnakes. They reach over there with those rattlesnakes and they start uh, handling those things and, and they use this verse as their, as their uh, premise. We give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Now, I'm just gonna be honest with you. If I'm ever in a church and they bring rattlesnakes out, I'm out of there. I'm done, I'm gone. Uh, 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 it reminds me of the little boy standing in the foyer of the church looking at a bunch of pictures of people in, in uniform and he's standing there and his mama said, what do you think? He said, man, this is amazing. He said, uh, what, what, what's all, who's all these people? She said, well, these are people, members of our church that died in the service. He said, was it the morning service or the night service? <laughs> I'm telling you right now, I wouldn't be hanging around to see anybody die in any kind of service if they brought the snakes out. But in this passage of scripture, he's telling his disciples they had power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in verse number 20, he says, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I'm thankful that when I got saved, God wrote my name down in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Uh, when our uh, middle boy Stuart was born, our first two were born at home. Marissa and Spencer were born at home. My wife had them with a midwife and uh, she was supposed to have Stuart at home with the help of a midwife, but she was having some complications and she had to keep going back to the hospital there in Washington, Georgia uh, in order to have sonograms and just kind of uh, stay abreast of what was going on. And uh, 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 Stuart, Stuart was uh, supposed to be a girl. Don't tell him that, but that's what they said he was gonna be during one of those sonograms that they did on him. And I'll never forget one day my wife, she said, I gotta go to the, uh, uh, we lived about 45 minutes away, 35 minutes away in, in, in Deering, Georgia. Uh, you, you've never heard of it, uh, you've never been there. If it sounds familiar, that's just a mistake because you've never heard of it. There's not even a, a, a red light in that town. It's a flashing caution light and that's about it. Uh, but anyway, we lived in Deering and she went to Washington to have another sonogram. I was at, uh, at Lake Oconee, I was at Edenton, Georgia. I had a construction crew at the time and uh, was in, in, in Bible college at night and working, running my construction crew during the, during the day. And so I was there when uh, I got the phone call 
uh, that uh, she had gone into labor, early premature labor, while she was having her sonogram, and the doctor said, you better get here, Mr. Shifflett. We're fixing to do emergency C-section. I said, you can't do that until I get there. He said, well, you better hurry. He said, I can't wait long. He said, She's got to, we got to do this. And uh, so I, I told all the guys, I said, y'all have to just take care of yourself. And I jumped in my truck and I drove, probably the fastest I've ever driven in my life. I drove, I mean, I had a governor in my, in my truck. It kept cutting out at 90 or 95 miles an hour. I was passing 18 wheelers on the emergency lane. I mean, I drove from uh, Eaton, Georgia and got to Washington, Georgia. I didn't even know where the hospital was. I'm looking for that big old H sign. I didn't know where it was. Finally, finally, I found the hospital. I slammed on brakes, slid up in there, ran indoors, and, and they, they, gave me, uh, they gave me the coronavirus uh, uh, mask and the gloves and, and the gown and the, and the shower cap and all that. Boy, you should have seen me. I was something else. And, and man, a minute I walked in the operating room, they started cutting, they started the, uh, the process and, and had that emergency C-section and Stuart was born. And they asked, they asked us, they said, they said, have you got a name uh, for him? I said, well, no, he, he was supposed to be a girl. And I don't think Callie Brook, that was the name we had picked out, Callie Brook. I don't think that he's going to want that name. I, 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 just, I can see a lot of fights on the playground at school if we name him that. So uh, we, we, we said, now we just got to think about it a minute. And they said, that's fine, we'll just put baby boy Shiflet on his, on his bracelet, and they did. And so they, they put a baby boy bracelet, uh, a baby boy Shiflet on his bracelet, and I noticed as they was, uh, took him over to the side, they were starting to work with him, he was having a hard time breathing, turns out being five weeks early, his lungs were underdeveloped, and uh, they were deflated, they had some fluid in them and everything, boy, they was really uh, struggling with him, and they finally came over there to him, and they said, we're gonna have to take him to the other hospital up in Augusta, it's about 45 minutes away, we're gonna have to take him uh, to the other hospital and uh, we don't really have the, the things here to see about him that this is, this is bad. This is a bad situation. Of course, Grace is there. They just performed a C-section on her and they're finishing up with her and she's out of it. And, and I'm leaning over and I say, we got to have a name. They say, we got to have a name. We got to have a name before we take him to this other hospital. Uh, uh, and uh, they said, we don't want to take a chance on uh, getting him swapped out with somebody else's kid, which I'm not 100% sure that that, ain't, that didn't happen. But in any case, they, they said, oh, we got to have a name. Well, I said, well, we ain't had time to think about it. And Grace said, don't matter to me, whatever. Just she wasn't in, the, in all there and she, just, she didn't care. And I said, well, what about Stuart Lane? I remember leaning over and I said, what about Stuart Lane? She said, that's a pretty name. So I told him, Stuart Lane, S-T-U-A-R-T -T, after the Confederate General Jeb Stewart, James Ewell Brown, amen, uh, Stuart. That was where we got that name. And Lane Frost was the, was the, the world uh, bull riding champion, rodeo guy, Lane Frost. I saw him, saw him ride a, a bull one time. I saw him ride a horse one time. Made an impression on me. I named one of my kids after him. Stuart Lane, we just came up with it, just kind of right there. And, and they, they wrote it on his, on his little bracelet and they took him to the other hospital. And that's how Stuart got his name. Say, what's all that about? I'm just saying that when we, as parents, have children, we name them. Can I tell you something? When you got saved, according to John chapter number three, you were born again. You were born into the family of God. And when you were born again, your heavenly father wrote your name down in a book called the Lamb's Book of Life. He was taking names. He's still taking names. Everybody that gets saved today, he writes their name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you know what I really like about him writing down our name? It don't, that pencil don't have an eraser on it. Amen. Amen. When he writes our name down, he writes it down. Amen. He said in one place over in the Old Testament, he says, I have, uh, he said, there, you don't have to worry about me forgetting you. He said, I will remember you because I have graven you in my hand. What about that? When he said, no man can pluck you out of the Father's hand, no man can pluck you out of my hand, that's because he wrote us down, our names down in his hand. What about that? And so I'm thankful this morning that God has taken names and the devil will sometimes come and tell you you don't belong to, 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 the, to God, that you've never been saved. Take him back to the place where you bowed your head and you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and you just remind the devil that God has already written your name down in the Lamb's book of life. Paul said in Philippians chapter number four and verse number three, I entreat thee also, true yoke fella, help those women which labored with me in the gospel with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. What about that? Paul the apostle, he believed also that the Bible teaches that when a person gets saved, God writes their name down 
in the book of life. I'm grateful this morning that my name is in the Lamb's book of life. I'm uh, just, I'm thinking this morning about all the different uh, names that people go by. Uh, I got picked on, I get picked on a lot for my name. Um, you know, my first name is Michael. Most people don't know that. Michael, middle name is Stacy. And uh, before you say that's a girl's name, you need to understand I was named after that character on the Virginian. Okay, my parents like watched westerns back in the 70s. And I was named after that guy named Stacy. He was a man, by the way, named Stacy on the Virginian. Yeah. You say, well, how do you feel about that? Well, I'm just glad they didn't name me Trampus. That was the other guy on the Virginia. Hey, man, can you imagine my name being Trampa Shifflet? Trampa, that sounds like Trampa. I'm, I'm, I'm just glad uh, that, that, uh, that they named me. Hey, man, you can call me whatever you want to call me. Just call me when it's time to eat. I don't care. <laughs> Little Zane, his name is Stetson. Stetson Zane Shifflet. I like cowboy names. I like cowboy names. There's something about them. Western names, they're kind of strong. Amen. My wife's name is Dolly Parton, Grace, Elizabeth. No, I'm just kidding. She's not, it's not, I just, <laughs> she's not here so I can pick on her. I'm just joking. It's not at all, I promise. I got a response out of Brother Angel. It was worth it just to do that. Amen. What I'm saying this morning is that he wrote our names down when you got saved. If you've been saved by the grace of God, God wrote your name down in the Lamb's book of life. I'm so grateful for that. Number two, let me hurry. We see in uh, Acts chapter number one, turn over with me if you've got your Bibles open, I hope you do. Turn over to Acts chapter number one. Uh, we see some, uh, another passage of scripture that talks about some names being written down. Acts chapter number one and uh, verse number 15. The Bible says, and in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of names together were about 120. Write this down, number two, God's taking names of the church. He's not just taking names of those that have been saved, those that have been born again, those that have been converted, but he's writing down, he's keeping up with the names of those that are in the church. Now, I know there's a lot of disagreement about what I'm about to say, but that's fine. I'm the one doing the preaching, and so I'm gonna preach it the way I believe it, but there is no such thing as a virtual church. I just wanna go ahead and get that out, okay? I, 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 there's no such thing as a virtual church. Church, I will probably preach more about this uh, in the days and weeks ahead because I don't want to take a chance on anybody getting the wrong idea during this shutdown right here. But what we're doing, the way we're having church this morning, this is not at all what God intended. And this is not at all what Jesus had in mind when he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is not at all what the Bible had in reference to when it talks about the church. Now, before you get worked up, before you change channels, before you turn me off, I need you to understand something now. I've been studying the local church and the doctrine of the church for nearly 30 years. I know what I'm talking about. You can't have a virtual church any more than you can have a virtual marriage. You can't have a virtual church any more than you can have virtual children. Hey Amen. Looking at two, look, people looking at one another on a screen does not an intimate relationship make. Come on, right. Amen. Just thought I'd get that out. And we got folks tuning in from all over the world and I hope they believe and understand what I'm saying. I'm not throwing off on anybody that's not a member that hasn't got their name written down on the rolls of Calvary Baptist Church. I just wanna let you understand something. There's no such thing as a virtual church. Church needs to be together. Church needs to be together to have congregational singing. You read the book of Psalms. David said, let us get together and let's praise the Lord together. Let's exalt his name together. Let's raise our voice and sing together. Amen, you can't do that virtually the way God intended for it to be done in a group. Church needs to be together to observe the Lord's Supper. Could you imagine us trying to have the Lord's Supper tonight? That ain't gonna work. That's not gonna work. Uh, the first time they had the Lord's Supper, they were gathered together in the upper room. They were together. The church needs to be together to observe water baptism. We had not had a single baptism in those ba that baptistry since it's shut down. You think God's happy with that? You think the Lord's happy with that? I'm not happy with it. 
This is the longest span of time we've gone without baptisms in, in 65 years of this church being here probably. Church needs to be together to have fellowship, to have accountability. I'm nervous about people don't like coming to church. They might have a problem with accountability. So I can't see, I can't see right now whether or not you're watching the service. I can't see whether or not you're watching me or if you've got me on your phone and you've got the soap operas on your big screen. I can't see. There's no accountability at all right now. I mean, we got a little bit because we can see people commenting on the Facebook, but Lord of mercy, this isn't at all what God intended. In Acts chapter number one, they, the Bible says that the number of names, it didn't say the number of people, it said the number of names, that's what your Bible says, meaning that those people that were there were there because they were supposed to be there. Their names had been written on a church membership roll. Absolutely. The Bible puts things in there for a reason. The, Bible needs, the church needs to come together to practice church discipline. You can't have church discipline virtually. You can't have a business meeting virtually, trying to take on missionaries. Amen. We gotta be together to do all that. Church needs to be together to bring the unsaved in and to be able to pray together and to be able to grow together. You're right there in Acts chapter number one. The Bible says they had a list of names. The number of the names was about 120. Look at chapter two. Look at verse 41. They that gladly received his word were baptized in the same name, they, the same day they were added unto them, about 3,000 souls. You can't add something to something that doesn't exist. Okay, so there was a church with a geographical location that had a pastor, had a membership role, had a group of people that were there in Acts chapter number one, and then Acts chapter number two, 3,000 people got saved, and they were added to them. Let's keep going. Look at verse 42. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Preacher, we can have fellowship through Facebook. Not like you can in person. I don't care what anybody says. It's a poor, poor excuse. It's a poor substitute. I came up here Friday night and I sang for an hour and a half to an empty church. Wasn't a saint. And God met with us. I got to cry on one song, backed up and sung the whole thing again. I mean, God, God's, but I mean, God does that with me when I'm by myself. That ain't nothing new. I get up here sometimes and sing and get to crying and God gets to speak into my heart. Ain't nobody else in here to see it or hear it. You being on Facebook didn't make that happen. That was just me worshiping God and you got to watch it. But I'm telling you right now, it ain't the same. Right. They were fellowship and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Look at what it says in verse 44. And all that believed were together. I'm not going to get it. If you disagree with me, please don't. Don't, don't, uh, don't, don't text me. Don't get on my, 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 my social media and try to reprove me and rebuke me. Just keep your opinions to yourself. Well, you can have a virtual meeting. I was on a virtual phone call yesterday. I had a, there was dozens of pastors for an hour and a half. I had my earbuds in and for an hour and a half, I had a conference call with dozens and dozens of pastors from the Northeast region talking about churches being shut down and what we can do. And I'm just gonna be honest with you right now. You can say whatever you wanna say. Yes, we were in on a conference call, but we were not together. Right. We're not together. We're not together this morning. We're doing the best we can under the circumstances, but man, this, this, is, this is tearing my heart out this morning, preaching to an empty church because we've got church members whose names are on the roll and they're supposed to be here and we're all supposed to be here together. That's the way God intended according to Acts chapter number two. They that believed were together and had all things common. Look at verse number 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, verse number 47. People were getting saved and joining the church, getting baptized every day. I said, Preacher, what are you saying? I just need to get that off my chest and I'll say more about it later. I'll preach a little bit more about it later. I don't think any of our church members would disagree with anything I just said and we're having to deal with what we're dealing with right now, but this is not what God intended and I'm not happy with this. I'm not, I'm not gonna settle for this. 
In fact, I, I, I got on the phone yesterday morning and I called and organized a meeting with local pastors in Maryland. We will be meeting this week and talking and we've already written a letter. I wrote, spent most of yesterday comp composing a letter to our governor and we're just letting him know that we're not happy with this 10 people minimum in our churches. I mean, we got enough room in here. We can have a whole lot more people still practice social distancing. Families are living together. Why can't they sit on a pew and go to church together? Makes no sense to me. Say, we well, ought to just be happy we can live stream. I'm not just happy we can live stream. I want to be in here with my church family. I'm doing everything I can within means and within reason to try and get things changed and make a difference and push back a little bit on some of this stuff. I don't think it's right for the liquor stores to be open and the, uh, and the marijuana dispensaries to be open and the abortion clinics to be open and the hardware stores to be open and the churches are shuttered. Churches are closed. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. And if you don't like what I'm saying, please keep it to yourself because it ain't going to make no difference with me. You ain't going to change my mind one bit. I'm dead set on it and I'm right. This is how God intended it to be. In fact, in Hebrews chapter number 12, Hebrews 12 and verse number 23 in verse number 22 down through verse 24, look at it, Hebrews 12, verse 22, and, but, uh, but ye are come uh, unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. What about that? And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the sprinkling of blood, and he goes on and on. He's talking about when we get to heaven, there's gonna be a new Jerusalem, there's gonna be an innumerable company of angels, and there's gonna be a, the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. I looked up that general assembly. That's the only time you find that phrase in the Bible, by the way. General assembly in the Greek, panagoras, it means a gathering of the whole people to celebrate public games, or other solemn events. What about that? The word church in this passage of scripture is translated ecclesia in the Greek, a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place, an assembly, an assembly of the people convened at the public place of the council for the purpose of deliberating an assembly of Christians gathered for worship in a religious meeting. That's what General Assembly and church in verse number 23 is talking about. It's talking about the collective body of Christ in a group and their names are written in heaven. I'm not making that up. That's what the Bible says. To the General Assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Don't you think if he's gonna build a church, he's gonna keep up with who's a part of it? You better believe he is. <clears throat> he's gonna keep up with who's a part of it. I just thought I'd throw that out there, amen. He's, God's taking names of the converted. He's taking names of the church. Thirdly, let me hurry. Is everybody still with me? Well, the same people that was here when I started still with me, Amen. In Revelation chapter two and three, turn over there, Revelation chapter number two and three. I'm trying to wind this thing down. Revelation chapter two and verse number three. Jesus is talking to John on the Isle of Patmos about seven churches and he's talking to seven churches. He's giving him a message for seven specific, by the way, seven specific geographical located churches. Now there's a lot of people that likes blowing that universal church horn. It's a universal church. There's this one church. Will you tell me why he had seven specific, very specific messages to very, seven very specific churches if all the churches is just one church? There's seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Sure there is. And they were in a location. Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. Calvary Baptist Church is Calvary Baptist Church of Dundalk, Maryland. Amen. And seven times, all seven times in this writing, Jesus said this, I know thy works. He said it all to all seven churches, I know thy works. And he gave very specific messages. Look at what he says in chapter three. Look at chapter three, verse number four. Thou hast a few names, look at there, even in Sardis, 
which have not defiled their garments. Write this down. He's writing down, taking names of the consecrated. He's keeping up with the converts. He's keeping up with the church. And he's keeping up with which ones of the ones in the church is living a pure, clean, godly, righteous life. He said, not in verse number four, that there, thou hast a few people or a few members or a few individuals or a few men or a few women. He said, thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He's taking names this morning. You say, I'm a member of Calvary Baptist Church. That's wonderful, and I'm glad you're a part of our church, and I'm glad that you're under the umbrella of this local church and this assembly, but I want you to understand something. You can't get to heaven uh, just, uh, when I say get to heaven, you're not gonna be able to get to heaven to stand before God at the judgment seat riding on the coattail of all the other church members. There's a personal relationship that God is expecting you to maintain, and he's taking names. The judgment seat is going to be very personal. When, he, when we stand before God at the judgment seat, Brother Barley, he's not going to call, okay, I want everybody that's a member of Calvary Baptist Church of Dundalk to come up here and judge us all collectively as a whole. No, no, no. We're going to all be judged individually. And he's taking names. When he comes to pay, hey, when he comes time for him to pass out crowns, pass out trophies, pass out rewards, it's going to be personal. Amen. Is everybody still with me? Some of y'all didn't know that was in there, did you? Thou hast a few names in Sardis that have not defiled their garments. God sees, God knows, and trust me, he's taking names this morning. Look at chapter two, back up to chapter two. Look at verse number 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, while I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. What's he do? He's, he's gonna write a new name on a stone to those that overcome. That's what the Bible says. I'm just reading the Bible. Look at chapter three again. Look at chapter three. Look at verse number 12. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall Go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. What about that? God's taking names of those that overcome, those that keep their garments undefiled from the things of this world. Boy, I could preach for another hour about that, but I feel like right now God's wanting us to bring this thing in. Listen to me carefully. God's taking names. God's taking names. You say, well, how important is this taking names? I'm glad you said that. You're in Revelation. Turn over to chapter 20 right quick and I'm done. You got to see this. You got to see this. You say, well, I, I think I can just kind of fly under the radar. I remember one time I got baptized at Calvary Baptist Church. I remember one time Brother Caldwell baptized me. Or Brother Howard baptized me. Or the former pastor, I remember he baptized me and I joined the church. I, I'm okay. I'm good. My name's on the church roll. Hang on just a second. Your name being on the church roll it ain't near as important as your name being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I'm going to prove it to you from the scripture. Revelation chapter number 20. The Bible tells us in verse number 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open and another book was open. They make coloring books, by the way. Those ain't comic books. Those aren't picture books. Those ain't coffee table books with beautiful pictures of America and trains and guns and tractors. Oh no, these books right here, it's got something far more important in them than that. Listen to what he says. The books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And look at verse 15, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God's taking names. How important is it, Pastor Shifflett? Well, the Bible says we're gonna be judged out of those things which are written in the books, and when God writes it down, son, it's written down. There's a lot of news today about them rewriting history. They're trying to rewrite history right now about something that happened last month. 
Nancy Pelosi was on TV this morning talking about how, what a terrible job President Trump has done with this coronavirus. She was just in February in Chinatown in San Francisco trying to get everybody to come down there and attend the parade. She, they're trying to rewrite history right now and a lot of people's getting away with it. But let me tell you something. When God writes something down, it's there, buddy. When he writes it down, you don't change it, I don't change it. And he's taking names this morning. The Bible said in verse number 15, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast to the lake of fire. That's gotta be some of the saddest verses in the Bible. Whosoever whose name was not found written, whosoever was not found written in the book of life. Now the Bible says whosoever was not found. I gotta ask this question. I wonder who it is doing the looking. This is the great white throne judgment. Everybody that's at this judgment's lost. Everybody that's in this portion of scripture right here is that happens a thousand years after the rapture takes place. A thousand years after the seven years tribulation period rather is what I meant to say. A thousand years later, there's the great white throne judgment. Everybody that's at this great white throne judgment is lost. And I think it'd be safe to say that most of them's probably already been to hell. They've already been to hell. Every law, did you know Cain? Cain from, from Genesis is going to be at the great white throne judgment. Absalom. All those Old Testament people that, were, that didn't believe God and didn't trust God and didn't walk with God, they're going to all be at the great white throne judgment. All the people that died without Christ during the thousand year reign, all the people that died during the seven year tribulation period when most of the world's population, two thirds of the world population dies. They're gonna all be at the great white throne judgment. Most of these people have already been to hell. A lot of them have been to hell for a long time. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, I wonder who's doing the looking. I just can't help but believe that, that, that God looks down and says, your name's not here, son. Your name's not here, ma'am. Oh, but my name's gotta be there. I went to church. My daddy was a preacher. My mama was, uh, played the piano. My, uh, I sang in the choir. My kids went to Calvary Baptist School. Surely my name's got to be in that book somewhere. And I can almost imagine God saying, well, here, if you can find it, you can go to heaven. See if you can find it. And they're going to look and they're going to search and they're going to look and they're going to search frantically, desperately. But their name's not going to be found because it's not there. Whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast to the lake of fire. I just imagine the scene when God looks at the angels and says, take them, cast them in the lake of fire. And they're like, can I keep looking? Surely can I keep looking? It's got to be in there somewhere. I know I went to the altar one time and I prayed. I know I went forward one time during vacation Bible school. I know one time that I prayed a prayer with a junior church worker and my name's got to be in there somewhere. Here's the problem. Jesus said in Matthew, in that day, in that day, many will say to me, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have we not done many wonderful works? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never wrote your name down in the Lamb's book of life. And you might have been throwing my name around. And you might have been serving and ministering in my name. But I did not write your name down. Your name is not here. And in that day, I will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Ye that work iniquity. And those people are going to be standing before God at the great white throne judgment, arguing and debating with a sovereign, holy, righteous God, saying, my name's got to be in that book. God said, I never took your name down. I never wrote your name down. I never, I don't know you. I, I know all them that come unto me. I, I know my sheep. They know me and they, they hear my voice and they know me and I know them. I, I don't know you. I never wrote your name down in the Lamb's book of life. I wonder this morning, as Brother Payne gets on the piano, I want to ask you a very profound question. Do you know for sure if your name has been written in heaven? Is your name in the Lamb's book? Book of Life. We sing a song, I Know My Name Is There. Our youth choir sings, I Know My Name Is There. 
My name is in the book of life. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. I know my name is there. There may be someone watching this morning and say, Pastor Shifflett, I don't know. I don't know whether or not my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I, I think it is. I, I hope it is. I, I just, I'm horrified to think that maybe it's not there, but I'm not 100% sure if my name's written down in heaven. It's the most important thing. More important than you being a member of Calvary Baptist Church. More important than you walking down the aisles and putting your name on a card and becoming an official part of our church family, becoming an official member of this body. More important than that is your name being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And here's what we're willing to do this morning through the social media, through the, through the technology that is available to us under these circumstances. We're willing to help you. If you're not 100% sure that you're saved, why don't you take your cell phone this morning? Just text the phrase, we need to talk. I need to talk to somebody. If you're a lady, you can tell us you're a lady. If you're a man, you're a, tell us you're a man. And you text us and say, I need to talk. We need to talk. I need somebody to take a Bible. Show me how I can know for sure I'm saved. It would be our greatest honor this morning, just as soon as this service is over, to get somebody on the phone, call you right back, and with the Bible, show you how you can know for sure. Phone number's on the screen. This is not a prayer request line. This is not a call and chat. This is not a call and debate. This is not a call and ask questions. This is a text message number for you to text right now and say, I need to talk to somebody right now. I'm not sure my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm not sure my name's written down in heaven and I just need somebody that knows their Bible better than I do to show me from the Word of God over the phone what I need to know, what I need to do to make sure my name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you're a lady, we'll have a lady call you. If it's a man, we'll have a man call you in just a few minutes. Just, just give us time to get off, the, off the, 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 the live stream and we'll have somebody call you right away and help you maybe understand how you can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. God's taking names this morning. Would you let him write yours down if he hadn't already? Now, if he's already written your name down, he, he's not going to write it twice. Maybe you need to get right with God. Maybe you need to roll out of your chair this morning. Maybe you need to just stop what you're doing and repent and get right with God. And, 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 and maybe you ought to shoot for that, having your name written down among those that are consecrated, those that have kept their garments unspotted from the world and those that are overcomers. Maybe you ought to shoot for that crowd this morning. If you've been saved, you don't need to get saved again. You can't get saved but once. But maybe this morning you need to get serious about your Christian life and your walk with God. And God's taking names this morning. I'm telling you, God's taking names. Maybe you need to pray and ask God to forgive you. You've been involved in some things that you had not got any business getting involved in and God wants to help you this morning. Father, we come to you this morning in Jesus' name asking you now, if you would, to meet with God's people, those that are watching. Lord, there's no question in my mind. Somebody watching the message today has never been saved. Name's never been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Maybe they think it has, but it has not. I pray, Lord, this morning that you would convict their heart, draw them to yourself and show them their need of a Savior and give them the strength, the grace, and the initiative, Lord, to reach out to us today. Allow us to be able to lead them to Christ over the phone. Maybe they already know how to be saved, but they've never been saved, and you reveal that to them during the message. I pray today they would call out to you, repent of their sins, and receive you as their Lord and Savior. I pray today they would ask you to come into their heart and wash away their sins and make heaven their home. I pray, Lord, today that you would do something great in somebody's life. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank